Let's turn in our Bible this evening to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, and I would draw your attention to one verse, verse 9. Matthew 5 and verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you to stop tonight and to uh, just humble our hearts before you and an expression of thanksgiving, thanksgiving, it, it is recognized by us and I know by many around the nation that you have certainly demonstrated your grace, your love, by bringing this nation into existence. I believe, Lord, we can see so many things in history that point to your sovereign hand working and how you have blessed those founding fathers who honored you and who honored the word of God in the establishing of this nation. And Father, here we are in 2022. In this room, I know our hearts grieve to see so many in our nation who think nothing of it. And worse, those who stand in opposition to the principles, the righteousness, the liberty and freedom, the glorious truth and the salvation that is revealed in your holy word. But Lord, you've called us to such a time as this. May our hearts be aglow with the flame of thankfulness for those who have fought and died in our nation. May our hearts be filled with prayers for those who serve in our armed forces and stand on guard in harm's way. And Father, we pray that we will be faithful to use the liberty that you've given to us to proclaim the gospel of peace, even salvation in Jesus Christ, in whose name I pray, amen. As we come to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 9, uh, the, this is one of the Beatitudes that really gets my attention. Does this one get your attention? Blessed are the peacemakers. It certainly has gotten a lot of people's attention. People who read the word of God have paid attention uh, to this verse. We are aware that God spoke these truths to the nation of Israel. He was looking ahead to the kingdom, and the king was speaking to those who had the right to be the heirs of the kingdom, though none of them who heard his voice while he was here on earth ever saw the theocratic kingdom reestablished. Not yet. The principles that Jesus spoke are timeless, some of them speak directly to the nation of Israel. Some of these truths in Matthew's chapters 5 through 7 speak directly to the nation of Israel. Some of them speak directly to the 70th week of Daniel, the tribulation that's yet ahead. And yet many of these truths are timeless and speak to all of God's people throughout all time. I believe this is one of those timeless truths. God's blessing is on the peacemakers. And they shall be called the sons of God. Now, this is not how they become the sons of God. You and I know that. The word of God is very clear. Sadly, some people who just come to the word of God to find sourcing material rather than to listen to what the Bible says will come to a verse like this, and they would like to promote some kind of a social gospel that says, by being a peacemaker, that's an evidence, or that's how you become a son of God, where the opposite is true. Those who are sons of God are those who engage in peacemaking, and God's blessing is on them. I believe that's what the Lord Jesus Christ was saying here. Blessed are the peacemakers, just like God's blessing is on those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Just like God's blessing is on the meek, just like God's blessing is on the poor in the spirit. Broken-hearted is where Jesus Christ begins. 
but we're looking at verse 9 tonight. Blessed are the peacemakers. It's an unusual word. It's a compound word, two words put together. It's the word hirene, which is the word peace, and the word poieo, put together. Uh, it'll be a tough for me to say it, but I'm going to give it a try. Hirene poioi. You can tell I'm not Greek. <laughs> That's the word. It's a compound word. And it's more, it's not, I should put it this way. Let me say it this way first. It is not merely saying, blessed are peaceful people. That's not what this word means. The idea of peace is in there. But that word poieo is the word to do or to make. And the word we get in our English translation here, peacemakers, is accurate. Blessed are those who make peace. The word is speaking about those who get involved in resolving conflicts. The word speaks of those who seek to bring parties that are at odds or are striving one another to bring them back to a place of harmony, tranquility, at the very least, a place of respect for one another. Well, we live in a, word, we live in a world where there's very little respect for one another. As a matter of fact, apart from God's word, we find very, very little of that in our time and every time. There's been very little peace. There's been lots and lots of war. Lots and lots of fighting. A lot of the fighting, like James said, is because men desire to have. They fight so they can get the spoils of war. Thankfully, there have been wars that have been fought to attempt to preserve liberty and peace. And I, I believe that there is a sense to which that is righteousness. I know that because the Lord Jesus Christ, when he returns to this earth in order to establish peace, he's going to have to put down, by means of the words spoken from his mouth, he's going to have to put down all rebellion uh, you cannot always in this world reconcile everyone. But take heart, God can. God is able to reconcile all conflict, all war. But God's blessing is on those who are engaged in peacemaking. That is, those who are seeking to help those who are striving, to help people who are fighting or at odds with one another make peace. The word is not limited to national wars. It's also limited to interpersonal conflict. It could be in, in the midst of a family. It could be in the midst of a community. It could be in the midst of a company or a neighborhood. It could be in the midst of a, a, a church. Blessed are the peacemakers. Those who seek to bring others who are striving with one another, who are out of harmony, blessed are those who seek to bring them together. Now, when Jesus announced God's blessing upon those who are doing the work of bringing about peace, we do have to be mindful first and most that the gospel, the message of the gospel is indeed a message of peace. God was in his son, Jesus Christ, reconciling the world to himself. And the only true peace begins with the peace that Jesus Christ paid dearly for in his blood on the cross of Calvary. And so the Apostle Paul writes in Romans 10, 15, How shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. And so at, at one level of blessed are the peacemakers is truly those who preach the gospel. God's blessing is upon those who preach the gospel of peace. This is the peace with God that we find through Jesus Christ, our mediator. There is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom to pay for our sins. How beautiful are those who preach the gospel of peace. Do you know God's blessing is upon those who preach the gospel of peace? And I couldn't help but miss, I, I couldn't help, it, I, I can't say it, 
I, I couldn't, how do I want to say this? Yeah, I, I, I didn't miss it. And, I, and it just, it's, so let me say it another way. This stood out to me really big because of my lesson this morning. Do you remember we talked about something beautiful this morning? Do you remember what it was? A beautiful heart, Luke chapter 8. Remember the four soils? And the good soil, Jesus interpreted as a noble heart. And do you remember the meaning of the word noble? It's a beautiful heart. What made that heart beautiful? In faith, it received the word of God, the seed of the word. That's a beautiful heart. Well, here in Romans 10, we have beautiful feet. I just laugh because we don't think of feet as beautiful, do we? I don't. I'm not going to show you my feet. But God calls the feet, whatever they look like physically, God calls the feet of those who carry the gospel of peace beautiful. Isn't that wonderful? That's precious. A beautiful heart and a beautiful feet. Do you have a beautiful heart? Thank God for it. Do you have beautiful feet? Look to God to further the preaching. Blessed are the peacemakers. Now, this is not limited to pronouncing the gospel. The peacemakers, as I said, can also be a matter of interpersonal relationship. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Now, we are not going to find our word here because the word peacemakers comes up once in the whole Bible. <laughs> not peace. That comes up much. We'll see tonight. The word peace uh, and making peace, the verb to be making peace, comes up. But peacemakers... It's just in Matthew 5, 9. That's it. That's the only place. But here in Philippians chapter 4, I want to draw your attention to verses 2 and 3. Paul writes, I implore you, Odia, I implore Sintichi, that they be of the same mind in the Lord. Now, why would Paul have to do that? Because they weren't of the same mind. Apparently, there was some conflict between these two dear Christian women. Now, that never happens, right? Don't answer that. Conflict can happen between anyone, believers, unbelievers, men, women, children, conflict. And Paul had to write addressing that. Verse 3, and I urge you also, true companion, this is another man. In the Greek, it's a Zizekis. It could have brought his name in. I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are are in the book of life. And so that means that if true companion, if Sisychus obeyed what Paul said, do you know what he was? A peacemaker. A peacemaker. Somebody who is engaged in people who are at odds and bringing them back together so that they are in harmony. The word peace means tranquility. It means the absence of war and strife. It means that there's harmony and there's agreement. And while these two dear women had harmony and agreement in their faith in Jesus Christ, apparently at this particular point when Paul wrote, it ended there. Whatever it was that they were disagreeing about, whether it was how the ministry should be done or a, a, a situation that was going on, there's so many things that come up in life that cause us to be potentially at odds. But God wants his children to be in harmony with one another. God wants us to have peace. And Paul wrote, and he said, true companion, and wouldn't he be a true companion if he fulfilled that role? I want you to be a peacemaker. I want you to help these women to get right with one another and be right with the Lord. Turn with me to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. This is something that's true and important for every believer in Jesus Christ. We find it throughout the New Testament epistles. Here in Colossians chapter 3, verse 14, we read, But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. That's a lot. And God the Spirit wants to enable us to embrace all of it. 
Notice the importance of love. If there's truly going to be a complete bond of union and harmony, we have to have love for one another. Because the truth of the matter is, when it comes to things that are personal, we don't always see eye to eye. We don't always agree. Oh, Lord, help us. God says, I want to help you. I've poured my love into your heart by my spirit who dwells within, Romans chapter 5, and I want you to choose my peace, the peace of God, as the rule of your heart. In other words, when there is a conflict between me and a brother and sister in Christ, do you know what God's rule is? Get it resolved. That's what God wants. He wants us to get it resolved so that there is peace and there is harmony. Now that will take humility, and peacemakers understand that. Peacemakers understand that pride is the source of contention. Humility is the grounds for healing. That's a word to, that's a, a truth to just put in your satchel if you're gonna be a peacemaker and to take with you. Uh, those who act as mediators between nations know there's going to have to be concessions. When two nations are at odds, then concessions are going to have to be made in order for there to be some kind of a ground upon which those nations can agree to be at peace with one another. It's a blessing for the people of the land when there is peace, and it is devastating to the people of the land when there is war. Such is the true, whether it's between a family or whether it's in a neighborhood or a community or here in the local church. The body of Christ, we read in verse 15. And the rule in the hearts of God's children is the peace of God. The peace of God. I have peace with God through faith in Jesus Christ. And now God wants me to be at peace with my brother and sister in Jesus Christ. And when we do so, we are actually showing forth that gospel of peace. And so may the peace of God be that rule by which we go in the local assembly. Now why is this? Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Why is the peace of God his rule in the church? The answer to that is in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 33. Now when we come to 1 Corinthians 14, we have to remember the context is chapter 12, 13, and 14. These three chapters all go together as Paul addresses a great problem of contentions at the church of Corinth. Well, there were a number of reasons why, but in these three chapters, 12, 13, and 14 of 1 Corinthians, Paul's addressing contention over spiritual gifts. Contention because of spiritual gifts over how they conducted their worship service. There were problems. There was all kinds of disorder. I might even use the word chaos in their worship services. And this did not honor the Lord. Paul addressed it by teaching, by instruction, and then here in chapter 14, he lays down the rules. This is what God wants his children to obey as a set of rules when they gather together for their meetings. And he begins it in verse 26. Now in the midst of that context, I want you to see this truth in verse 33. For God, all these rules, how many people can speak in tongues? How many people can prophesy? Who can interpret? Who discerns? All of these rules that are given is for this reason. Verse 33, God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. God is a God of peace. He's not a God of confusion. Where there's war, where there's strife, where there's problems, disharmony in the local assembly, God is not honored. But where there is peace, we honor the Lord. Isn't that beautiful? Blessed are the peacemakers. Why? For they are called the sons of God. Do you see it? This is the characteristic of God's children. Why? Because God is the God of peace. And let me tell you, in heaven, there is peace harmony. There is beautiful tranquility and tremendous harmony in the worship of Almighty God. Now, do you know how that's possible? Because God is the center of all of it. And when God is at the center, it is easy to bring ourselves in humility into alignment 
and to be at peace with one another. Isn't that wonderful? That's something else to add to your list. Pride is the source of contention. Humility is the grounds for making peace. But the focus in the church, the body of Christ, ought to be God. And when we focus on the Lord and put him first, then the peace follows. Because we want to honor him. It enables us to put our things to the side and put God first. And there is peace. Because God is a God of peace. Not only is God a God of peace, but I want you also to notice that his kingdom is peace. Turn to Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14. Now as we jump from context to context, <clears throat> what this points out to us is how prevalent is this theme of peace in the word of God. It's a very prevalent theme. It's very important. Here, as we come to Romans chapter 14, we alluded to this passage. We were in a different verse here this morning, but we talked about uh, Christian liberty. That's what Paul's talking about here. There were problems. And there were problems because people were having disputes. We see that in verse 1. Receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. Can doubtful things cause a lack of peace? <laughs> Apparently so. I, I would answer, wherever two human beings are, the potential is for there to be disputes because of our sinful hearts. But God gives wonderful instruction here because he wants peace in his assembly. And Paul kind of uh, begins his conclusion that way. Notice verse 17. Uh, Romans chapter 14, verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Boy, we can get things out of order. Those of us who are Baptistic in our ways, some people from the outside think there's one thing that unites our churches, and that's our fellowship meals. <laughs> We're known for our eating. Now, wait a minute. It's okay to eat. It's okay to fellowship around a meal. There's nothing wrong with that. But that's not primary. We see here that God's kingdom is not eating and drinking, but what's primary? Righteousness is primary. Peace is primary. Joy in the Holy Spirit is primary. These are the things that God wants to see when he looks down. Now, when we talk about the kingdom, I know some people get confused, but you have to remember that in Matthew chapter 13, the Lord Jesus Christ explained the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. And even though the king came, he didn't establish the kingdom. And that was because the nation of Israel rejected him. So the theocracy was not reestablished in Israel. It didn't happen. The king returned to heaven. That's where Jesus is right now at the right hand of God. And so does that mean there is no kingdom? No. It means that the kingdom hasn't come yet. And he's coming back to return it. Well, what about in this time between? Well, there is a spiritual aspect of the kingdom. All those who place their faith and trust in the king, according to Colossians chapter 1, have been translated, they've been removed from the power of darkness, that's Satan, and they've been translated into the kingdom of God's son, the son of his love. Aren't you thankful to be in the realm of Jesus Christ? It's hidden to the world, by the way, except when they see Jesus Christ and God's children. Because the king is on the throne. He's coming again. But right now, the kingdom is God's working it out in and through, at this moment, the church. That's not going to be. The church is not the kingdom. Don't misunderstand my statement. Because the church is going to be raptured, and then there's going to be the 70th week of Daniel. And God's going to keep right on working. And the kingdom aspect truths of the presentation of the gospel is going to keep right on going and the church will be gone. So don't confuse the two. But right now, God is working through the church right now. And there is an aspect in which we, because we are in Christ, are in the spiritual aspect of the kingdom. You say, how do you know that, Pastor? Because I just read Romans chapter 14 and I read verse 17. And Paul speaking about the kingdom the kingdom of God. And, and what's important to God is that we understand what God values in his realm. What does God value? One of the three that Paul mentions here is peace. 
Blessed are the peacemakers. So God is the God of peace. Paul calls him. We have it, the author of peace. And his kingdom is to be among righteousness and peace and joy. It's to be a peaceful place because we are under our heavenly Father who is the God of peace. And so there should be harmony and agreement. Isn't that precious? It's beautiful. It's God's way. Turn to James chapter 3. James chapter 3. God is the author of peace. His kingdom is a kingdom where he values peace, righteousness, peace, and joy. And so it should be no surprise to us that his wisdom for us today is peace. Notice here, I'll begin in verse 13, James chapter 3. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy, self-seeking exist, confusion, and every evil thing are there. Now, when we allow our fallen sinful nature to get the best of us, and we're going to interact with one another in the sinfulness of the flesh, we are not demonstrating the wisdom of God. We're demonstrating a very earthly wisdom that is none other than demonic in its character. And that's sad. But notice now, in verse 17, But the wisdom that is from above, heavenly wisdom, is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. Blessed are the peacemakers. God's wisdom is the way of peace. It's the way of peace. So that means that God's wisdom is not the way of strife. If you find yourself striving, then you're not following God's wisdom. God's wisdom is a way of peace. Now, I know we strive against the devil, the evil one, but God has promised the victory, hasn't he? Hasn't he said, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will what? That sounds peaceful to me. And you know, in Philippians chapter 4, God says that when we go to God in prayer, do you know that God will guard our hearts and minds through Jesus Christ in what? Peace. Peace. Because that's God's way. And so, God's wisdom, when we follow God's word and put it, his truth, into practice, we are putting the way of peace into practice in our lives. Blessed, blessed are the peacemakers. So notice verse 18. Now, the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. That's the closest we get to peacemakers. That's the verb form. And may God's children truly be those who sow, who sow the fruit of righteousness in peace. Why? Blessed are the peacemakers. May God help us to see how important peace is to him and how he wants to bring it forth in his local assembly, how he wants to bring it forth in our lives as a demonstration of his working and his way that we might honor him. Blessed are the peacemakers. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. And we seek by your grace to honor you, the God of the word, by understanding your will and your way. How I pray, Father, that we would look to you for your grace to be those who are embracing the God of peace and the way and wisdom of peace and be looking to help those who are struggling and have not found peace, that we may honor you. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.